Good morning, Grace. Uh, my name is Nate Inglestad. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And this morning, uh, we're going to be continuing on our study of Yeshua, Messiah King, as we've been uh, looking chronologically through the four Gospels. So many of you probably have wondered, you know, what are we skipping between Matthew and Mark and John, and we're back, you know, back and forth. So our plan was to move chronologically through them, and so sometimes we have to move between Gospels. Uh, this morning we're going to finish out uh, John chapter 6. So Phil was in John 6 last week, uh, and today we're going to finish out uh, John chapter 6. Is there anyone who is here that doesn't have a Bible or notes, that needs a Bible or notes? Anybody here? Uh, in one? Okay. We have a few here. I'm not picking up the signs again, but I hope that's right. I went over for Jerry. Anybody else in the back? Mago's got one, needs one. Oh, uh, I don't know about you two. All right. Well, an interesting thing, I don't know if you, any of you, when you're teaching, uh, but I can speak for myself, and I think I can speak for the rest of the pastors here, but as we are, we're preparing for the week and you're going over this passage, you just, you start to just turn it over in your head and turn it over, and pretty soon, by the end of the week, like, it's really all you're thinking about. You go to sleep thinking about it. You wake up thinking about it. You're just turning it over in your head. And it almost takes you to the point where you feel like you're going crazy. Maybe that's just me. That's not, I'm not going to speak for Matt and Paul. But last night, I, I possibly just went over the line because I had this dream. You ever have these, like, really vivid dreams where they're not a dream in your mind? I mean, you are living this thing. So last night, I'm sleeping. I have this dream that I'm, I'm in the Philippines I'm on our, the island there on Barangunan, and I'm still preparing to teach this message today to you. And I'm going to do it over the phone. And I don't know how, how that was working, but then I was actually contemplating calling you, Paul, and asking you to teach it for me in my dream. So I don't know how that relates or where we're going with that, but just as a forewarning, <laughs> that's what happened last night. Uh, but... Megan and I, we lived, uh, my wife and I and our, our family, uh, but for Megan and I, we lived most of our lives, our adult lives uh, in the Philippines. So we spent about 13 years uh, there in the Philippines, and most of that time was on this little island uh, called Barangunan, which is way off the map that you wouldn't even uh, be able to find it if you had a good map of the Philippines. It would take you a while. And there on, on the island, our lives were so, so different than our lives here in America were. And the people there, the lives of the people there on Barangunan were so different than the lives of us here, uh, the rest of us living in America. They had no constant source of electricity. Um, they were basically, you know, off, really off the grid. Uh, they had no uh, access to, you know, running water. So they, anything they needed to do, they were uh, pulling out of the wells. And they actually had no, um, you know, access to cell phones or anything like that. They were pretty well off the grid. They didn't have access to these things. And so uh, when we moved to this island, you know, this island that was basically subsistent rice farmers and fishermen, simple people, and as we moved there, Megan and I, we saw they had two, two real major needs, things that were just glaring to us as we moved. And we could, we could see this, you know, from day one. But their glaring most just visible needs that they had was the first one they didn't have any access to quality medical care. Uh, no access to quality medical care. And you can see, you know, in the death rate uh, of pregnant mothers. Uh, you can see that in the death rate of people that just had simple infections. So just simple medical things that could be solved by going even just to the urgent care. No access there. So we saw that. that was a, it was a big problem for them. This was a physical need that they had. And then the second thing that we saw that they had, that they didn't have, that there was a need for them, was they had no access to spiritual care. No access to spiritual care. And what I mean by that is they had no access to spiritual life. Meaning they were born there on the island, and like we're all born even here, they were born as sinners. They were born separated from God. They were born cut off from the life source. That's the way they were born. But the difference about them there was that there was no access, there was no ability for them to be connected to this life source again because there was no one in their language who could clearly articulate or 
explain to them or tell them God's story. There was no one there who could tell them about Jesus, the God-man sent from heaven, the one that was able to make things right between God and man if they would believe and accept in him as the one to do that. They didn't have access to that. So that was a huge problem, a huge problem. And so as we moved to Baranguna and we moved our, our family there, you know, those were our focuses. Those were the things that we focused on initially. We began to learn their language and their, their culture, the way they did things, the way they thought. But the whole time, you know, we're seeing these physical needs, but we're longing to share with them the spiritual needs that they had and the answer to this. Because we carried with us words, words of life. Or we carried with, we knew God's story, we knew Jesus. We could clearly articulate to them who he was, where he came from, what he could do for them. We could clearly articulate that, and we always longed, even greater than meeting their physical needs, we longed to be able to share with them these words of life that would meet their spiritual need. We longed to do it. And so, you know, this affected, affected us daily. Whenever we would uh, have people come to us with sicknesses, and we would quite often, in the middle of the night, during the day, uh, we'd have people at our door for various things from worms, you know, they'd have, that was a big problem there for them, just having uh, worms in their, in their bellies. You can imagine, I mean, that stinks to wake up with that feeling. And you might, I, know I'm not, I know I'm speaking to people who have never had that feeling, but it's horrible. And it's simply fixed by a little pill. That's it. You know, people come to us with big cuts that were getting infected, you know, where they're starting to have lines moving around where you know, hey, this only leads one place. But we could, we could fix that. And so I found myself, as I'm fixing these simple, you know, medical conditions, saying harder and harder things, more kind of straight things to people that came to me. Because always my desire wasn't just to simply fix a cut, but our desire was to tell them these words of life, right? to give them something that would not just fix their physical needs, but would fix their spiritual needs. And so we'd say things. This is what I would say. People would come to me and I'd have, you know, see that they had an infection. And I would get the medicine and I'd have, you know, the penicillin, whatever we were giving them, the moxicillin, whatever we were giving them for this infection. But I would say, you know, uh, older sister, older brother, look, see this medicine here that I, I have to give you? Like, it, it's good. It will help you today. But it's not, it's not perfect medicine. Because tomorrow you might get another infection. And if you don't get it tomorrow, like I say, tomorrow you may not get it, but in a week you may. And if you don't get it in a week, it's going to be a year, and if it's not a year, it's going to be 10 years, but someday you're going to get a sickness or you're going to be too old or something's going to happen and you're going to die and there's nothing that I can physically, there's no medicine I can give you that will stop that. And I said, because you have a bigger problem, you have a bigger problem that this medicine right here, cannot touch. And I wanted, especially in those early days when we couldn't really, hadn't shared with them God's story yet, we wanted so badly for them to not just see this as what we were offering them. But we wanted them to say, Ate, I have something so much greater, so much greater, that it's not just meets your physical need, this is going to meet a spiritual need, your spiritual condition as you're cut off from God. This thing, this medicine, and it's not even a medicine, it's a person. Right? And he's the one that can make you right with God. He can meet your spiritual needs, and this, we always longed to be able to share this with him. And so we would share these, sometimes hard things. Right? That's a very straight thing to say, like, hey, you're going to die. Right? That's not, that's a, that's a bit edgy, and that, that some people, you know, you want to almost cover your ears with that. But we don't talk like that. That's what I would say, you're going to die, and you want this medicine, but I have something far greater than that medicine to share with you. And it usually would go two ways. You have people who would want this physical benefit, right? They, they want the physical medicine that you have, but they would reject anything else you had to say. It's too hard. It's too hard, because wrapped up in that saying you're going to die is you don't know the way to live. Right? That's wrapped up in there. 
And so that's hard. And some of the people, they, would, they didn't want to hear that. They wouldn't want to hear that. And so they would accept this physical benefit. And they would come back. They would keep coming back for that. If they got sick again, they would come back. If they needed wood cut for their boats, they would come back. If they needed, you know, this or that or the other physical needs, they would always be there. If they needed money, if they needed rice, they would be there. They would come back. But they would not come back or they would not listen to anything spiritually we had to say. And that, it would, grieved us. Because we had, you know what you have. And if you would just accept it. So there was that group of people. And, it, and me saying the hard thing would push them away, actually, from us. It would push them away. But then there was another group of people who would hear what we had to say. Like I, I could give you names. I could give you stories. A guy named Tonio. And I won't have time to get into him. But guys who would hear this hard thing. And, and I remember even Tonio, he would do this face like this. Because it would hurt. It just hurt his head. Nate, what, what you say just hurts. But it would draw him closer. He would say, you know what? You do have something. And I, I want it. I don't, I don't know exactly what you have. Like, I, ca I can't even articulate it. And he'd do that. But it would draw him closer. Every time we taught, when we got to the point where we would teach and we could explain to them clearly the gospel, we could teach God's story. Antonio, he was there every single time. And he wasn't deterred by the hardness or the straightness of what we sa saw, what we would say. But he was just brought by the fact that we could give him something that he needed and he wanted. And it drew him close. Didn't understand it at first but it drew him close. You know, today, in John, our finish out, John chapter 6, we're going to find that same thing happening. Jesus is going to say some hard things. He's even going to say hard things, and then he's going to push it even farther, and he's going to say harder things. And we're going to see that there's going to be two types of people there as well. There's going to be two groups of people. And some are going to move away some are going to move away from Jesus because of it. They're going to hear the things he said, and they're going to go, mmm, that's, that's too hard. People who have followed him, possibly for years, and they're going to listen to what he says, and they're going to say, that's enough. It's too hard, and they're going to move away. And then there are going to be those who are like Tonio, and they're going to hear what Jesus has to say, this hard thing. And they're going to recognize it as words of life. It's words of truth. And they're going to move closer to Jesus. They might not understand it all right now, but they know who Jesus is, and they know what he has, and so they move closer to him. And that's what we're going to see today. As if you look there in your Bibles in John chapter uh, 6, we're going to start uh, in verse 25. But just to give you a little background, Hattie, would you... Throw that map up there for me. If you can see here, this is the northern part of, of Israel, uh, the Sea of Galilee, if you can, you can read right there. But Jesus has just been with his disciples. So you remember Phil taught a few weeks back that they needed a break, and so they took their boat and they went up there to this wilderness place outside of um, Bethsaida, and I think that would probably be to the south there of Bethsaida. And they're there with his disciples, and instead of getting away, uh, if you remember, people just flocked to them, right? It says 5,000 men were probably talking in the neighborhood of 15,000 people, and they need something to eat. And so Jesus miraculously uh, provides them bread. So he creates, he makes bread for them. He multiplies those loaves, and they eat their fill, and they go home. And if you remember, actually in there, they, he does the bread, and they, want, they actually want him to be king. And so Jesus pulls back from him because this is not going to happen at this time. And so he puts his disciples in a boat. And I think they're there at the south part of uh, Beth uh, Bethsaida. And he puts them in a boat and he sends them out. And then Jesus goes up to a mountain and he's praying. And while he's praying, he sees his disciples. It's, it's become night now. And the wind has kicked up and the waves have kicked up. And they are just making zero headway. And so Jesus goes to them. And he walks out to them on the water. And as he gets in the boat, remember they're, they're 
freaked out of their minds. Right? They think this is a, a spirit out there, and so they don't know what to do. And then Jesus, hey, hey it's, it's me. Don't worry. And he has Peter walk to him on the water, and then he enters the boat. And then the next thing they know, they're at the shore. Of, and I think they're around Capernaum. So they're out on the shore at Capernaum. They overnight there or whatever's left of the night. And then the next day, he takes his disciples and they travel down to Gesineret, uh, just south of Capernaum. And they spend the day there healing and doing uh, miracles, fighting for people of that region. And then as night comes, I believe they go back up to Capernaum and they overnight in Capernaum. And Jesus wakes up the next morning, enters the synagogue. This is a synagogue he's been to many times. This is a place that he's taught at many times. Jesus enters the synagogue and he begins teaching there. So while this is happening, while his disciples and him have been over in Gesineret, the people who ate the bread wake up. And that morning Jesus is in Gesineret, but they spend their day searching for Jesus. You know, they woke up, and what do you think? Did they wake up full or did they wake up hungry? They woke up hungry, right? The bread that Jesus provided for them was a physical bread. So they ate it. They ate their fill. They were happy. The problem with eating physical things, right, you get hungry again. So they woke up hungry. But they had that picture of Jesus that he had just done something amazing. He had multiplied bread. Possibly in their minds it made them think to the manna in the wilderness. They were in a wilderness place. So it's almost as if Jesus was like their former prophet Moses. He provided something, bread, substance for them in the wilderness. And so now they want to know, where did Jesus go? Or we need to find this guy. Or we're still hungry. Maybe he can give us something else. And so as they're looking, they go back to the place where Jesus provided the bread. Maybe they're looking for scraps. I don't know. But they go back to the last place they saw Jesus. He's not there. And then as they're coming back into town and they're on the shore, there's boats that come down from Tiberias. And Tiberias, they come across the lake and they meet them there. And possibly they say, look, he didn't go south. So where did he go? So they get in their boats and they go to the next town over. And they meet him and they find him there in Capernaum. So the crowd finds Jesus and they meet him. And as they arrive He's teaching there at the synagogue. So if you can picture that setting in your head, and I think this is one of the keys to this passage, is to understand you know, what the setting is, or who's, who is here in Capernaum listening to Jesus, right? So who do we have? We have the people of Capernaum who are attending the synagogue, right? We have the 12 disciples who are with Jesus. We have looks to be the religious leaders of the, the synagogue of Capernaum. And then we have this group of people, I'm not told how many, but a crowd of people that has arrived that has just eaten bread from Jesus and want more. So that's our setting. Right? We have these different types of people, different groups of people. There are probably some here who are convinced of who Jesus says he is. That he's Messiah, and they believe that. But then there's also that we're going to find out those who don't. Right there, they don't believe who Jesus says he is. They think he's crazy. They want to actually shut him up. They want to put him down. They don't want him spreading this anymore. But then there are others, and possibly the majority of the people there, the crowd, who don't, they're undecided. They don't know. And I think this is the group that Jesus is speaking to. This is the ones that he wants to move. He wants them to make this decision to agree and to understand who he is. So let's read what happens. We're going to pick it up in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, so that's the crowd who had just eaten, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. So when the crowd from Bethsaida arrives, 
You know, you, they're a little bit surprised, and they ask this, I think it's a bit of an awkward question, and they're like, Wait, when, when did you get here? Right, how did, and the, the question is, how, how did you get here, Jesus? How did you beat us? Right, we saw you go there, and now, now you're here. People came, from, you weren't there. Right, it's a bit of an odd, they don't know what to say. Right, and this would be a good time, don't you think, to Jesus to tell them how he, how he got there. How did he get there? He walked, right? He walked on water. <laughs> right, what a great, I mean, Jesus, take him out around the boat a little bit. Show him how you walk on the water. Or wouldn't this be a great time, this crowd building time? Like you could get a mass behind you. But no, Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he just exposes their motives. Right? He exposes their motives. But they haven't come because they've seen the things that Jesus has done and now they believe him. Right? They ha- they're not there yet. They don't believe Jesus yet. So they, they haven't come because they've seen what he's done and they're acting in, in response to that. No, they're acting in response to their stomachs. They're hungry. They want Jesus to produce for them more physical bread. And so Jesus doesn't answer them. He doesn't provide them bread, but he answers this in two ways. Right? He says, actually, there's two types of bread that men or anyone can seek. There's two types of bread. There's physical bread that's temporal, that you, know, you wake up, you can eat, but you'll be hungry again. And then there's like spiritual bread, or spiritual food. He hasn't quite called it bread yet. There's spiritual food. And the people who eat this food, this one leads to eternal life. This food doesn't simply perish, but it, it actually grows and it leads to eternal life. And he wants them that they should strive, so they shouldn't work for the one. They shouldn't work for the temporal food, or he wants them to, to change their focus from this physical food, and he wants them to desire the spiritual food. He wants them to desire this spiritual thing. He wants this for them. And so the crowd, though, it doesn't seem like they quite get it yet. They don't get this better bread that Jesus is offering them. But they still want this temporal bread. And it seems like they kind of get caught up on Jesus' what he says about them to work for, they were not to work for the food that perishes. And you can see that in their response. Look in verse 28. Then they said to him, well, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. And so they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see you and believe, that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so Jesus here, he, he begins to correct their thinking. Right? To, to receive this food that God offers. Right? They weren't to do something. Right? They weren't to work. There was nothing they were to do. Because it was God the, is the one who was doing something. He was the one that was working, what they were to do was to believe in something. Right? And more specifically, Jesus is explaining they were to believe in someone. They were to believe in someone, the one that God sent. Okay, so there was a specific someone that they were to believe in. And the crowd here, it seems to be, he seemed to understand that Jesus is referring to himself, but they don't quite accept what Jesus says. They, they, they're beginning to get the picture here, but they're not quite on board. And so they say to Jesus, okay, give us a sign. As a matter of fact, we have a sign that you could perform that would make us believe. Right? They're still thinking back to the bread, and possibly here they're even thinking back to a thought that was in the religious circles or in the, teacher, the circles of the religious leaders of the time that when the Messiah would come, that he would provide like Moses did. So they're thinking about this, and they're like, okay, make us believe. Provide this sign. You did it for one day. Moses did it for 40 years. So provide for us this sign, and we will believe in you. They have this, this specific thing that they want Jesus to do 
to provide for them. And so Jesus answers them. Look at verse 32. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So Jesus corrects again their thinking in a few ways. He says, first, it wasn't Moses who provided you the manna. Right? It, was his, it was his father. It was, it was God who did this. Secondly, uh, he explains that the manna was not actually true bread. You know, what does he, what does he mean by that? So this manna wasn't the true bread. It was actually just this, it was a picture of something to come. And it was put there for you to help you understand something greater. Do you remember the medicine that, that I would give out? You know, that it, was, it was medicine, of course it was. But there was something greater than that medicine. They had a bigger need. Right? The manna in the wilderness, yeah, it was bread. It was physical bread. They ate it. They sustained their life for a time. But they still died. But this bread now that has come down from heaven, it's greater. It's a, it's, it's a fullness. It's the biggest picture of that bread that came down from heaven, the manna. It is the real bread. It is the true bread that Jesus is talking about. And the last thing he clarifies for them is that this true bread isn't like they think it. Right? It isn't a thing. It's a person. Right? It's a person. And this person has come down from heaven. And he doesn't just provide bread like God did for them in the wilderness that was just for the Israelites. Like This bread is so much greater. Because this bread provides life for what? The entire world. Right? The bread that was given by Moses was, was good. It helped them live. It would provide substance for them. They didn't die in the wilderness. But it wasn't like this true bread. This true bread that comes down from heaven is so good that it has the power to give life to the entire world. Right? It's so much greater. So much greater. And so the crowd responds as probably all of us would respond, right? They, they're not quite, there. they're not there yet, but they want this bread. And of course they want this bread. Right? This bread is greater than what we had in the wilderness. And so they say, they blurt out to him, and look in 34, they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Give us this bread always. And Jesus says to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst, but I said that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, I think that statement that they make, give us this bread, that they want, give us this bread always. I think this is an honest statement. This is, they're showing their desire. They want this. If you remember, this is a similar thing that the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, said to Jesus when he offered this living water. Right? They, he said, give us this bread always. She said, give us this water so that I don't have to keep coming to this well. And the desire, they want this thing that Jesus has to offer. But they haven't quite got it yet. And Jesus says that. He says, they, you, you, don't, you don't believe yet. So they haven't openly rejected Jesus, but they haven't believed. They're still deciding. They haven't put it all together. But why do you think it was so hard for them? Why do you think it was so hard for them to believe? Jesus has done, in Capernaum alone, that, that are recorded for us. Right? We know that there are many things Jesus did that aren't recorded. Many things. 
and John even says that they're, you know, two, you couldn't even contain them in all the books in the, the world. All right, so there was a lot of things that Jesus did. But we know in Capernaum there was at least 12 miracles that he did that proved who he was, that proved his claims. Right, he's done enough. He has proved himself that he is who he says he is. He's the bread of life. He's come down from heaven. He's divine. He's deity. He is God's son. He has proven this by the things he has done. Yet the crowd still can't quite put it together. And I think part of the reason, as we're going to see as we go on, is that in this room, sitting with them, probably sitting in the seats that are the best seats in the house, are their religious leaders. The people who have been teaching them their whole lives. You know, how did they hear about God? Well, it was through these men. And then what are they saying about Jesus? That he's not who he says he is. And so I think that was this huge block or this huge stone to them that they, it was hard for them to decide that we have to go this way with our religious leaders or we have to believe Jesus. And it was difficult for them. And I think we see that here in the next chapter, the next verses. Look at verse 41. And so the Jews grumbled about him. And we know when, when John uses that term Jews, he's speaking of the religious leaders. That's who he's speaking of. And mostly these are the ones who are in, they, they object to Jesus. They don't agree with him. And so now we've, Jesus has been interacting with the crowd. But all of a sudden, it seems like the religious leaders are sitting near Jesus. They've had enough. They've had enough of what Jesus says, so they begin to grumble about him. And why do they grumble about him? Because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and whose mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and has learned from the Father comes to me. Not that everyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So I think here we see this back and forth or this problem that the crowd has to overcome as they hear Jesus and he's in direct opposition to what their religious leaders or the spiritual leaders have taught them. You know, they've taken control of this conversation and they've given their answer to where Jesus came from. He says he comes from heaven. They go, no, we know your mom. We know your dad. We know your brothers and sisters. How at this point in your life can you tell us that you came from heaven? Right? They give an alternate explanation for what happened. And had they looked, had they studied where Jesus came from, had they talked to Mary, talked to Joseph, talked to the people around who knew Jesus, right? They would have found out something else, wouldn't they? They would have found out this wasn't a normal birth. This wasn't a normal thing that happened in, in Mary's family. Right? This wasn't usual. Something else happened here. And it would have cast doubt on their claims. Right? But they didn't. No. They're outright, they're forceful, we know where he came from, and he didn't come from heaven. And they want the crowd to follow them in this. And so Jesus responds, though, not with shock, not with horror. How does he respond? And it's a very interesting way to me that he responds. He says, look, this is no shock where, why these guys don't believe in me, because the Father has not called them. Right? The Father has, how can they come to me unless the Father calls them? He's going to say that more explicitly later. So he's preaching here. He's, his answer is election. He says, they have not been chosen to follow me, and so they're not going to believe in me. 
He's looking at the crowd and he's saying, don't, why would you follow them? Like they haven't been chosen by the Father and so they're not credible. Don't listen to them. Like he still wants them to partake of this bread of life that he can only provide. And he doesn't want them to listen to this crowd, but it's not a shocking thing. He says they haven't been called, so why would you listen to them? Why would you listen to them? Now the religious leaders, they move from his grumbling uh, to openly arguing, and it seems like they're even arguing or talking amongst each other. Let's look at verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drink on, drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. So now we have the religious leaders as they hear you know, this first statement Jesus makes about being the bread of life, come down from heaven, you have to eat of his flesh, you're not chosen, and then all of a sudden they're arguing amongst each other. How can he say that? And you can see them as they erupt in this crowd, there's probably some, a bit of a turmoil here as there's arguing, there's discussing, and there's confusion. And no one knows quite exactly what is going on. And Jesus pushes this analogy even farther. Right? You would think if I was writing this, I would be like, Jesus, okay, enough. Right? No, he pushes it even farther. And to those who are strictly hearing Jesus in only this physical lens, like, what is he saying? He's talking about cannibalism, isn't he? Like if you're just, you're just thinking in the physical that's a hard thing Jesus just said. And even the word, the word for to feed on his flesh, he's not saying just eat my flesh. No, it's, it's this word for like noisily chewing on food. Right? Even the word that he uses, it's like, whoa, Jesus. And you can tell, what does it do? To those religious leaders, it pushes them even farther away. Right there, what is he talking about? I cannot believe. Can you believe, I mean, they are just floored at what Jesus says. Right? They can't quite get it, and it pushes them one way. And we saw that on Barangunan as well. And when we made that hard statement, right, to some it pushed that way. But to others, we're going to see this, like, like for Tonio, and it's going to do it for Peter, that they may not understand it all right away, but it's going to draw them back closer. It's going to draw them back closer. Let's read the two responses there to Jesus' teaching. In verse 60. So when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about him, said to them, do not take, do you take offense, excuse me, he said, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It's the Spirit who gives life, not the flesh, or the flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit in their life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back, and they no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, You want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet 
one of you is the devil, is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So the, what Jesus has said, these aren't, and these aren't the religious leaders even at this point. Right? Who are they? Who leaves? Disciples. Right? So we're not talking about the twelve. Often we refer to them as Jesus' disciples, and that's the twelve. But this is the bigger, larger group that has been following Jesus. And so because of what he's said, this, the hard truths of what he's saying, there's some who have followed him you know, for months, for weeks. I don't know how long they followed him. But there are some who listen to what he says and say, this is too hard. And they leave. They walk away. But then he turns to the 12, and you can imagine that scene and the tenseness of that scene. And Jesus looks at them and says... Are you leaving too? Are you going to go away as well? Is this too hard for you? And what's Peter's response? Is Peter going anywhere? Does Peter understand everything? No, but why isn't he going anywhere? Because who does he know? He knows Jesus. But he says, we know you have the words of eternal life. We're not going anywhere. There's nowhere else to go because we know who you are. We know who you are. They don't get the ins and the outs. He hasn't even spoken yet. He's alluded to his future death. But we're getting there. But he hasn't got there yet. So Peter's not, he doesn't understand everything. But he's not going anywhere because he knows who Jesus is. And I think maybe for some of us in this room, you know, that's something to be challenged on. Maybe that for you, you haven't put your faith in Jesus as the one to make things right between you and God, as the God-man. You're not there yet. You haven't been there yet. And possibly it's something that you don't understand that keeps you from that. Or maybe it's like the Trinity, right? Some hard truths that you're like, whoa, I don't quite get how that works. And if I don't quite get how that works, I need to understand that totally before I'm going to put my trust in Jesus. Or maybe it's something like this election thing. And this is, I mean, we, we don't even have the time to t- really touch that today. But a lot of what Jesus has been saying in here, he's talking about election in the sense that there's some people who the Father calls and they, they know Jesus, they believe Jesus because the Father calls them. But then there's this whole other side of things where Jesus is appealing to a crowd and they want, he wants them to believe him. But that's not election, that's somebody choosing, that's free will. There's these two things that are standing right next to each other in Scripture, this calling, this election by God, and then this free will, this choice of man. And we try to like, reconcile them often in, in their heart. They're not reconcilable. They're, but they're two truths that are both true at the same time. And you may sit there and you may know, I, Nate, I don't get that, and I'm, okay, I, I'm with you. But don't let that make you one of these disciples who just walks away. Make it somebody like Peter who has seen what, you, what Jesus has done, who have seen his miracles. He's proven himself over and over again. There's nothing left that he needs to prove for them to believe who he is. And I would say that for you as well. There's nothing that he hasn't done that hasn't been recorded. You can believe. You can believe there's enough. And you may not understand sometimes the ins and outs of it, but you know who Jesus is. And you trust him because what he said is true. You may not understand the ins and outs of it, but you know exactly who Jesus is. And I challenge you to respond in that way. If you haven't put your trust in him, do it today. Don't be like the crowds who walks away. And the second thing, and I'll call the uh, praise team up as we finish this last point. The second thing that was challenging to me is when Jesus uses this, this term that he gives uh, eternal life or that he's talking about um, salvation, like we often think of it just as salvation, being with Jesus, going to heaven, escaping hell. But there's also the side of it that he's giving them this words of life about how he's giving them life, how to live now. Right? There is an effect that belief in Jesus has on an individual now. And the source of it is the same source of salvation. It's Jesus. 
It's Jesus. And so the words he uses, are, they're, they're harsh, that feed, you have to feed on my flesh right, for, to receive that life. But it's true for us believers as well. Right? If we're to live in a world that's broken, right, marriages have problems, right, relationships broken, people broken, sin all around us, persecution, strife, right, if we're to live in this world, we have to feed too noisily on Jesus' flesh as well. That's where the source of life comes from. Or we have to do that as well. And that's not saying, like Jesus, I'm not saying you need to eat his flesh. I'm not talking about communion. But what it is talking about is that abiding, that putting on Christ. That those, those are the type of phrases. This is what he's talking about here. We as believers in Jesus, to, in order to live in this world, live Christ-like, to breathe and to speak words of life, we have to abide, we have to eat, chew noisily on Jesus. Right? How do we do that? And we're in his word. Right? We're, in, we're thinking, we're turning over in our heads what he's said to us, what he's taught his life so that we know and we can give those words of life to the people that we're in contact with. And we can be that life as well. We have those words of life. So I, just as a, a side note, I encourage you, if you're not in, maybe you're not, you don't even know how to be in God's word daily. You don't know what that's like. That's That's okay. But I'll tell you where you can find out. If you're a guy, every, we have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 5.30, you can get breakfast, and we study God's word together. There's different groups that meet here at Grace. 5.30, get up, come in, eat a breakfast burrito, come and chew on, chew noisily on Jesus' flesh with us together. Right? I know the ladies, on Tuesdays, we have a BSF studies. I'm looking at John back here, we have BFF study, BSF studies that are happening during the week. Go on the website, find out. All right, let's do it, let's chew on it together because this, for us, is where this words of life, where life comes from. It's where it comes from. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we love your word, we love you. Uh, we thank you for coming, we thank you for proving that you are from heaven that you are deity, and that we can put our full trust in you, Lord. I pray that if there are people here today who haven't yet done that, that they would now, that they would see you as the one come from heaven, the one who is the source of spiritual life, both for now and for eternity, and that they would put their trust in you. And for those here who have, Lord, I ask that you would encourage us, that you would uh, challenge us, that you would spur in us, that we could even spur in each other that desire to chew noisily on your flesh daily. We know that's where life comes from. We love you in your name.